Well, we are so excited to announce something brand new here at Bayshore Community Church. Available now on any of the app stores, either Apple or Android or even Amazon, is the exciting Bayshore Church app for your mobile device. Now, this app is chock full of content for you to use to engage with Bayshore. There's a sermon archive where you can browse past messages from both campuses. There's ways for you to sign up for classes, for events, for small groups. There's events calendars so that you don't miss anything that's happening. There's even a Bible reading section where you can get daily updates on where we are reading in the Bible. Also, this app has a great new giving feature, a very sleek and efficient way to easily give anytime you like and also have reoccurring gifts. So be sure to check out our app. You can go to bayshorecc.org slash app. That's bayshorecc.org slash A-P-P. And find links to download the Bayshore Church app. We want to welcome everybody that's listening to us on podcast and also those that are tuning in right now at Facebook, Facebook Live. This is a brand new series about how to deal with the messes in your life. How to deal with the, um, the confusing, chaotic things that are in your life. And maybe last year, 2017, you had some messes that you created. And to begin the new year, one of the things we need to do is clean up and address the messes in our life. And I don't know about you, if we were to just sort of go around and open up and share about the messes in our life. I bet every one of us have got some sort of mess, some sort of chaotic situation in our life that we need to deal with. A couple weeks ago, uh, I got inspired. I, was, uh, I had this storage shed uh, in the back part of my yard where I keep my lawnmower and some of my lawn equipment and garden equipment. And uh, I'm, I'd like to be a neat person. I like to sort of keep things organized. I don't know if there's anybody else that's sort of like you like things in order, you're obsessive compulsive, you need to be in therapy like myself. And, uh, but, but I had, the, you know, my, my garage attached to my house is, is pretty organized. It looks pretty good because people sometimes see that. But this storage shed that I have in the back, it is absolutely, was absolutely a mess. It's been that way for years. There's only a, a little path in there wide enough for me to pull my lawnmower in, my zero-turn lawnmower in, to. And, but on each side, there's just chaos. There's gas cans everywhere. There's old shingles that I've been holding on for years that maybe sometime I'd have to repair my roof. And so I've got these old uh, bundles of shingles everywhere. I've got these plant pots that are just everywhere. And you know those tomato things that you, little cages you put over your tomatoes so that they grow straight? I've got a whole bunch of those all bent up. And this, this, this garage, this little storage shed, is awful. I mean, it's just absolutely a, a, just a wreck. And I've been really embarrassed about it. And somehow when I pull in to that storage shed, it kind of makes me feel like that that's part of who I am. That I'm sort of disorganized. And, and uh, it just really bothers me. And I have this horrible fear that somebody's going to go back there, open the door, and look in. Especially my son's. I think, what if Tim or Joel, kind of wandering in the backyard and just happen to look into Dad's storage shed and they see the chaos, and I think they're going to think, what's wrong with our dad? Something's wrong with him that he would let this storage shed look the way it does. So a couple Saturdays ago, I don't know why I did this. It was like early December. I decided that I've been thinking about it for a long time, that I was going to clean up this shed. I've been thinking about it. It's been on my mind. Uh, you know, I've been, you know, I've been thinking about it for five years. I'm going to clean this shed up. Well, I decided one Saturday, it was kind of a nice Saturday in, in December, so I rolled up my sleeves, pulled the big trash cans back there, and I spent six hours, six hours in that storage shed, throwing things out, organizing things, sweeping the floor, big clumps of grass, dust everywhere. I swept, swept everything out, got everything organized, hung everything on the wall, and uh, got rid of a whole lot of stuff. Those shingles that I've been having for years, I just got rid of those. I'm never going to use them. I've had them for 10 years, and, and so I just got rid of them. And my gas cans, I got them all organized, and I hung the, the rake and the shovel on the wall. And I'm, I can't tell you how I feel about that storage shed. I wish you would come look at my storage shed. 
In fact, sometimes, this is no lie, sometimes I just walk back there and open the door and look at it. <laughs> it makes me feel so good. I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm going to take my boys back there, show them the story ship. This is the kind of man your dad is. And I, there's just something incredibly rewarding about addressing the mess. There's something really liberating about no longer avoiding that which you have been successfully avoiding and going after what you need to address and to clean up the mess in your life. And it's just amazing. I just, I just love the feeling. And you know, when, you, when you're avoiding something that you need to deal with, you know, it's sort of like something's always hanging over your head. And this is no lie. When I would drive my lawnmower into that, into that shed, you know, over the last couple of years, I would pull in there and I would just feel depressed when I got off the lawnmower. I'd just look around and I just thought, oh my, this is awful. It sort of was always hanging over me. But there's something incredibly liberating. There's something incredibly freeing about finally dealing with what you need to deal with. When you don't deal with what you need to deal with, it's sort of like having too many applications open on your smartphone. You get all these applications in the background, and it sort of slows down your smartphone so your smartphone isn't working the way it needs to work because you have all of these hanging uh, programs that are still open. When you think about your life, things that you're avoiding, things that you need to deal with are really affecting in a negative way your performance in the present. When you deal with things you need to deal with, you are more liberated and more free and more light so that you can perform and do better in the present, in the present situation you're in. So when I think about, I think about messes, I think about things that we, we tend to avoid, uh, we just have this problem of procrastination that we need to really address. Someone said this, they said, uh, they said that, uh, let me, hear it is here. Uh, procrastination makes easy things hard and hard things harder. Procrastination makes easy things hard and hard things harder. Someone else said, Napoleon Hill said, procrastination is the bad habit of putting off until the day after tomorrow what should have been done the day before yesterday. So we all kind of, we all kind of relate to that. And I think procrastination and not dealing with things is actually dangerous. My, uh, my grandfather, uh, my mother's father, my maternal grandfather, he was a farmer. And uh, he uh, had about an 80-acre farm. And he, uh, you know, farmed the farm, worked hard. And uh, I used to love watch him. He was the most mild-mannered guy, just most loving guy, just very gentle. I just loved him, except when he worked on his tractor. When he worked on his tractor, his farm all tractor, he'd be under there working on the tractor, and I never heard him use such language. I mean, it was amazing. But he had this, he was just a hard worker, hated to go to the doctor, and he developed this hernia. And this is a little bit of a morbid illustration, but he had this hernia that he developed, I guess, from, you know, lifting all those feed bags and pulling and yanking on the, you know, the, the equipment he worked with. And he had this hernia, and he wouldn't go to the doctor about it. He put it off. And uh, he would literally, it got so it was just noticeable, and he would literally, I would been in, I've been with him in the field when he was like planting corn, and he would lay on the ground and tuck his hernia back inside of his body. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how gross is that? And it got so bad that that hernia that he never dealt with got into his intestines, kinked his intestines, and he had to be rushed to the hospital and almost died. And thankfully, they were able to do surgery and fix that part that he was avoiding. And I think we've got some, we've got some messes that we need to deal with. Now, when I think about the messes we need to deal with, we're not talking about storage sheds, are we? We're talking about we're talking about relationships, relationships that we've made a mess of, relationships that we've said things to people, we've done things to people, and the relationship is absolutely a mess. And see what happens, it's like that program open in the back of our background. There's this unfixed relationship that we haven't dealt with, and it's sort of hanging over us, and it slows us down in the present. 
So sometimes we need to address a relationship. Now, let me just quickly say that sometimes you can try to address a relationship and that person doesn't respond and you can't do much about it. You've done everything you can do, so no worries there. But sometimes it's a relationship. Sometimes it's our finances. Our finances are absolutely a wreck. We're offering Financial Peace University. I don't know if it's in the brochure yet, but in the next uh, couple weeks, Financial uh, Peace University will be uh, available, and we think everybody at Bayshore ought to go through that. Uh, I recently talked, or actually Joel was telling me about a couple in Bayshore, a professional couple. Uh, He has a doctorate degree and uh, teaches at one of our local universities, and his wife's a teacher, very successful people. And their finances, even though they were very successful on the outside, their finances were a wreck. And they went through Financial Peace University, changed their life about three, four years ago. So sometimes our our finances are absolutely a mess. And so we need to deal with that. Sometimes it's our health. I just just really, uh, you know, think about this. How many know that you only get one body on the earth? Just look at your, touch your body right now and say, this is the only body I'm ever going to get. So you need to take care of your body. You need to eat right. Not like me, I got up and ate a brownie last night, I'm trying to quit that, but I... How many have ever just caved and ate a brownie every once in a while? How many? Just raise your hand. I, I, how many have ever... You've gone through Dairy Queen a couple times, you've gone through there. <laughs> and I'm working at that. But just taking care of yourself, exercising. You know, if you've retired, make sure you walk and move and exercise and take care of your body because this is... The, you can buy another refrigerator, you can buy another washing machine and dryer, but this is the only body you're ever going to get. So if you make a mess of your body, then you need to address that this year. You need to address that and work at that. So it could be a lot of things. It could be your health. It could be your finances. It could be your relationships. It could be, it could be your habits. Maybe you've gotten into bad habits in your life. You just, you've got into bad habits. You're, you're, you're doing things you shouldn't be doing. You're looking at stuff you shouldn't be looking at. And you've got this, this hab, these habits that have taken hold of your life. And, and your, your brain is starting to go in those directions. You're conditioning your brain to do certain things. And you need to address the mess this year. We need to address the mess. So how, how, do we, uh, how do we address the mess? First thing is, in order to address the mess in our life, we need to take responsibility for our mess. Say it with me. We need to take responsibility for our mess. Your mess is not your parents' fault. Your mess is not your friend's fault. Your mess... And my mess is not your spouse's fault. Your mess is your fault. How many of your mess has your fingerprints all over your mess? So there's something liberating about taking responsibility for your mess. Very, very important. I remember a couple years ago, well, quite a few years ago, some of you heard me tell this story before. Our church was very small at that point. We had a uh, we were, this building didn't exist yet. We're still in that old building that we're getting ready to tear down. And we had uh, maybe 80, 90 people coming to Bayshore then. And a and, uh, group of elders and I kind of governed the church. We had a board of directors and kind of thing and all that. And we, we were doing good uh, for where we had been. And so we decided we're going to buy a church van, a new church van. And, and you're not really a church until you have a church van. So we're going to get a church van. We got enough money to get a church van. We've been saving our money. We're going to get a church van with our name on it and phone number on it. And they were going to let me drive it, you know, because at that point I was the worship leader, the student pastor. I was the senior pastor. I was the care pastor. I was the secretary. And I cut the grass. So they were going to let me drive the van for, you know, church work and also for personal things. And I just had to keep a little log. So we got, we spent, listen, we spent months and months and months trying to figure out what van to buy the, our board they were like fired up about this van they did research and there was some debate about gmc versus ford in the board i didn't understand it but they went on for months about that we finally decided we're going to get a ford van and it was brand new got it from preston ford i believe and brand new the elder, one of the elders called me and said, hey, the van's here. And I had to go pick the van up at his work. Brand new van. Went and picked the van up. And how many know that smell when you get in a new vehicle? Isn't that a good smell? 
So we got the, I was in the van driving around. We had, the church was called Gumbera Fellowship at that point. So the church was written Gumbera Fellowship on the side and, and the phone number on the back and all of that. And I was driving the van uh, one Memorial Day. It was, we just had the van maybe a couple, couple months. And um, I was, you know, picked up my friend Tom Taylor and we were, I was picking him up. We were going to go play tennis on Memorial Day. And so we pulled into the middle school here in Millsboro. And there was a tennis court as soon as you pulled in, and then there was the bleachers for the football field, and then there was three or four other tennis courts. And when we pulled into the, into the parking lot of the uh, middle school, there was a, a, a one tennis court, and there was this little portly man, this little short man, playing tennis against this teenager. And this little uh, portly man, this teenager, would just run him all around. His little legs were running everywhere. And I was looking at that guy, that little portly man, Play, that, play tennis with that teenager. The funniest thing, he'd lob over his head. That little guy, his little feet would run over there and he'd get the ball. And I was watching that and I ran into a telephone pole. <laughs> I was driving and Tom was sitting there and I, no lie, I can't tell you why I did this. Instinctively, I turned and said, Tom! <laughs> like it was Tom's fault. I'm telling you, I begged Tom. I said, Tom, will you tell the board you were driving? I mean, I'll pay you off. Because I was sure at that point, I'd been in the church that long, I was sure that they loved the van more than they loved me. But, you know, we got through that and all that. But you know what's inter- interesting about that is that I was the one that had the steering wheel. I was the one that was holding on to the steering wheel. Tom wasn't driving. Why would I blame shift to Tom? How many of us, we blame shift? It's my parents' fault. It's my mother's fault. It's my wife's fault. I wouldn't be acting out on porn if my wife was doing this or that. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be in debt if, if this hadn't happened. I, I would be a better person if my mom and dad had treated me better. Listen, we all have baggage. We all have baggage from our childhood. At some point, we have to do the therapy, do all that. But at some point, we have to own our life and say, listen, we're going to move forward. My life is my life and my responsibility is my responsibility. Can you say big amen? There's something healthy about that. It's not negative. To take responsibility is never a negative thing. It's a positive thing. Because as long as you're in denial... As long as we are blame shifting to other people, we are powerless. But as soon as we take responsibility, we have power to make a difference in our life and to live a different way. There's a great uh, story in the Old Testament, the original story of Adam sinning. I love this story. Here's what it says in, in Genesis 3, 8 through 12. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to them, man, where are you? Now, you know, Adam at this point has already, he and Eve have already partaken of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And the Lord says to Adam, where are you? Where are you? Now, that's an interesting question from an omniscient God who made the universe and who knows everything. He says, where are you? And let me ask you a question. Don't you think the God who made the universe can find Adam hiding behind an azalea bush? What kind of question is that from God who knows everything? God knew exactly where Adam was, but it was his opportunity. God gave Adam an opportunity to say, God, I'm over here and I'm hiding because I disobeyed you and I did the wrong thing. It was an invitation from God for Adam to confess And then he said, uh, Adam said in verse 10, he answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. Man is now self-conscious. Before he was always God-conscious, now he's self-conscious. Sin makes us self-conscious. And that's why we're shy. That's why we're, we're, we struggle, because we're conscious of ourselves. Before that, man was conscious of God and man had confidence. Then he says, uh, here's what verse 11 And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? 
have you eaten? Say it with me. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The question is, have you eaten from the tree I told you not to eat from? How many know how many answers are there to that question? Have you eaten? That sounds to me like a yes or no answer. That's a question. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? Well, that sounds to me, it just sounds to me like there's, that's a simple answer. It's either yes or it's no. There's no other answer to that. And here's what he says. The man said, the woman, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some of the fruit from the tree that I ate it. And Adam fails the test. Adam has the, the, has the, has the potential, has the opportunity to address the mess at that point in his life. But he said, the woman... And it's not only, he's not just throwing Eve under the bus, he's throwing God under the bus too. He's saying, the woman you gave me. I was doing good until you gave me that woman. I was in here, I was having fun with the deer, I was, you know, fishing in the streams, everything's good. Then you gave me that woman. So he's blaming God. He's blaming God for what he's done. He's blaming the woman. He throws the woman under the bus. And then he throws God under the bus. And he's not taking responsibility for his mess. I will never forget years ago. I'm in counseling in my counseling office. You know, my office, people come into me for counseling. And and this guy comes in. This guy came into me. And, you know, I asked him why he came to see me. He said, I'm angry at God. I am angry at God. I am so angry at God. I am ticked off at God. I mean, I am angry at God. I said, why are you angry at God? He said, because I have a $20,000 gambling debt. And, I, and he said, why did God let this happen to me? No lie. Why did God let this happen to me? I thought, I didn't say this, but I thought, what are you, a moron? (laughs) God didn't let this happen to you. You let this happen to you. And and we just went around and around. It was like like nailing jello to the wall. I had never seen anything like it. He never owned it. He never owned it. And he's the one that got the gambling debt. And I was loving. I was a pastor. I loved him, prayed with him, and I thought he didn't get it. He was angry that God would let this happen to him. So it's important that we do that, that we take responsibility. So say this way, the first way, one more time, the first way to address my mess is to take responsibility for my mess. Then, you know, the Lord said to Eve after that, he said to Eve, he said, uh, uh, Eve, Eve was asked the question as well. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the serpent. The serpent deceived me. And of course, the serpent didn't have a leg to stand on, so he didn't have anything to do. <laughs> I preached this whole sermon to get that joke in. How about that? <laughs> The serpent, the serpent you gave me, the serpent, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The serpent deceived me. The serpent deceived me. I didn't know what I was doing because the serpent deceived me. And she's using ignorance as her blame. She's blaming ignorance. I didn't know what I was doing. I had a pastor tell me one time, he told me about this famous evangelist from the south guy was on radio tv that fell into a moral sin fell into sin and and the pastor was telling me poor guy he said the poor guy was at his office and some woman was out of town from out of town and he was working at his office the woman called and said she was out of town she had this crisis this emotional crisis needs some counseling and uh needs some counseling and and he was getting ready to leave for the day and so he uh he said well i'll stop by and see you at the hotel you know and give you some counseling and uh, so the pastor said, poor guy, he walked in there, and as he walked in there, you know, up something happened, and they fell into sin. 
And I said, poor guy, baloney. I said, that guy knew exactly what he was doing when he got in the car. He didn't get, he didn't get deceived. He was not He was not honest with himself. When he got in his car and he went to that motel room, he knew what he was going to do before he ever got to the motel. I didn't know what I was... Eve said, I I mean, I was deceived. I didn't know what I was doing. So responsibility is so important that we take responsibility for our sin. This is why I love 12-step programs. I love AA, you know, AA. Alcoholics and and NA and all that stuff. I love those programs. But what I love about them is I love this portion of them. That that admission and that humility that this is my problem. Because the day we begin to take responsibility is the moment we begin to grow. We aren't growing in denial. We're not growing when we are living in denial. We're not growing when we're blaming other people. I'm not growing if I'm blaming other people for my problems. I'm not growing if I'm throwing other people under the bus. As soon as I own my responsibility, I begin to grow, and I'm no longer a victim, and I've been empowered because now my life can change, and I can, can't grow until I own my situation. And here's what I love about this principle of taking responsibility for your mess, addressing your mess, and taking responsibility for it. I believe once you take responsibility, once you take responsibility for your sin, once you take responsibility for your mess up, once you take responsibility for your addiction, once you take responsibility for your infidelity, once you take responsibility for your porn addiction, once we take responsibility for whatever mess we've created, once we take responsibility for whatever relational calamity we've helped create, once we do that, we begin to grow and our life begins to change at that moment. There is no growth without human responsibility. Say it with me. There is no growth without human responsibility. I think about people that go through divorces, and I have such compassion. Bayshore is absolutely full of compassion for people that go through divorces. And uh, we've had a divorce in our own family, and we know the pain of that. And uh, people, so we open arms and love people through that. But let me, let me tell you the tragedy of divorce. People come to me, and uh, I know I love what North Point's uh, uh, Andy Stanley, North Point, uh, Atlanta, Georgia, our friends. We love Andy Stanley and North Point and all that. They have a policy. If you're divorced, at, if you were divorced and you come to North Point to get married, you can't get married again for two years until you process and work stuff through and figure out what's, what's going on. Here's the tragedy of divorce. People come to me and talk to me about divorce, and, and they've gone through this, and, 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 and they feel like it's the end of the world, and they've been divorced. We have a good friend. Their son's going through a divorce right now. And people come to me and they say, oh, just so tragic. I, you know, they're just upset. And I just, I absolutely have full of compassion. But you know what I ask them? I ask them, what did you learn? What have you learned from that divorce? What have you learned about you and what was your part in that divorce? It may have been 98% the other person. And I'm not, I'm not being facetious there. It could have been 98% the other person. But what have you learned about yourself through that? Was it, what have you learned about why you chose that kind of person? So make sure that you, that you learn what you need to learn from the crisis you're in. Don't blame, don't become blind by blame. Embrace responsibility because when I embrace responsibility, then I begin to grow. And say that with me, when I embrace responsibility, one more time, when I embrace responsibility, then I begin to grow. But here's what I love about taking responsibility. When we take responsibility, God helps us. God helps us. And, and if you've got a mess in your life, and you've got a mess relationally, you've got a mess that, that you've helped create, and you've got this mess, it may be addictions, it may be relational, it may be finances, it may be health. If you've got a mess... When you begin to address the mess, God helps you to address the mess. He helps you. He helps you. God's merciful. His mercies are new every single morning. Can you say big amen? 
His mercies are new every morning you get up. When I woke up this morning, Sunday morning, God's mercy was all around me, a sea of mercy. I woke up to a sea of mercy. Tomorrow morning, when I wake up, I'm going to wake up into a sea of mercy. God's mercies are new every morning, and He helps us. Quick, quick uh, biblical illustration. In the book of Nehemiah, if you know anything about the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah is about the city of Jerusalem torn down, and it's, it's, it's just devastated. The walls are torn down. The temple's been destroyed. And this guy named Nehemiah, names Nehemiah, named Nehemiah comes and helps rebuild the walls. And he gathers the people around. And in verse two, or chapter 2, verse 18, he said, Let us begin to rebuild. Nehemiah said, let us, I'm going to help you, we're all going to rebuild. And here's what's interesting about Nehemiah. The word, Nehemiah's name means comforter. He's a type of the Holy Spirit. And when you see Nehemiah, think of the Holy Spirit, comforter. His name means comforter. So there's devastation in the city of Jerusalem because of Israel's sin. But Nehemiah comes beside the people and he helps them rebuild their life. If you're rebuilding your life out of an addiction, you don't have to do that by yourself. God helps you. If you're trying to rebuild yourself relationally, God helps you. God is your helper. He helps you and he helps me rebuild our life. And finally, don't, don't give up. Don't give up. You know, when, when you have a mess... And, you, and you've tried to clean up the mess, and it's just so formidable. Like me looking in that storage shed. I looked in that storage shed. Do you know why I waited three years to clean that storage shed up? Because it looked formidable. I'm like, um, man, I don't, I don't think I can do this. And, and so sometimes you, you start trying to address the mess in your life. You start trying to clean things up. And things just, it just looks, you just want to quit. You just want to quit. It's just too hard. It's too hard. But being diligent, I remember when I was uh, taking a Greek class uh, through Moody uh, Bible Institute, uh, middle of the semester, uh, th- this guy, the teacher of the class, he, uh, he came on the tape. It was an extension program. I'd already taken Greek, and I was taking a, a, a refresher course. And he came on the tape. We're middle through. We're, we're memorizing all these endings, memorizing parts and verbs and all this stuff, memorizing the vocabulary. It's very hard. He's like, why? Oh, my gosh, you just got tired. I want to quit. And he quoted... Uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. I want to put it on the board. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm, let nothing move you, and always give yourselves fully. Everybody say fully. This year, fully give yourself to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. If I keep on dealing with my messes, it's going to pay off, and I'm going to come on the other side of that a different person. During Christmas vacation, I was watching a documentary. Uh, prime time, I had prime time, you know, Amazon prime time, so the video thing, so I, I was looking on there one day, and I thought, hey, here's a, it was a documentary on the pilgrims. So I watched this. It was basically uh, on William Bradford's life, who was the governor for a big part of the early uh, Plymouth College uh, Foundation there. But I was watching this documentary, and there's something that I, I didn't know. I didn't know this. They were, you know, 102 passengers on the uh, Mayflower, Mayflower, uh, May, uh, Mayflower uh, ship, 100-foot 100, 100 ship, 102 passengers on there. Part of them were separatists, uh, Puritans. Others were just like secular people put on the ship. There's one guy on the ship, guy by the name of John Holland, John Holland didn't know anything about boats, and they were in a storm one day, and he came out, he came out, that's John Holland there, he came out uh, on the deck, and a wave hit the deck, and he fell off the side of the Mayflower, and, and uh, on, the way, on, the other, uh, on the way overboard, he grabbed a hold of a, hold of a rope that was attached to the topsail, and he's hanging on. He's hanging on, and the water's thrashing him around. And the other, you know, passengers, they pull him up, and he, he's hanging on, and he barely makes it. They get him back on the ship. And when he gets to Plymouth, gets to Massachusetts, he marries a girl by the name of Elizabeth Tilly. And he's, John Holland is, a, is an indentured servant. And John Holland and Elizabeth, they have 10 kids. And their 10 kids have 88 grandkids. And later on, two million Americans can trace their ancestry to John Holland. And some of the ancestors you would know. Let me just uh, give you some of the ancestors. I've got them listed here. 
Uh, Alex Baldwin. Anybody know Alex Baldwin, the actor? He's related to John Holland. That's Alex Baldwin. Humphrey Bogart. Are you old enough to remember Humphrey Bogart? Here's a picture of hum Humphrey Bogart. Is that, how many old enough to remember Humphrey, Humphrey Bogart? I remember him as a kid. Then you got Philip Brooks. Here's a picture of Philip Brooks. Maybe we have a Philip Brooks. Maybe they don't know who. There's Philip Brooks. You know who he is? He wrote the song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. Uh, George Hubert Bush, 41st president of the United States. That guy is related to John Holland. And, of course, his son, remember he had a son that was president, remember that guy? George W. with that funny smile of his. Then Jeb Bush, Ralph Waldo Emerson, Henry Cabot Lodge, Christopher Lloyd. You know Christopher Lloyd was in Back to the Future? He's related to John Holland. Uh, Sarah Palin. Anybody remember Sarah Palin? Remember her? She's a descendant of John Holland. Franklin Roosevelt. Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormons. Uh, Benjamin, Dr. Benjamin Spock. And this person, Chevy Chase. Chevy Chase. I have, I have to ask you a question. What if he had let go of the rope? What if he had let go of the rope and had given up? But he was in a mess, and he was tenacious, and he held on, and because he held on in the mess he was in, God had an amazing destiny for him, and his life mattered, and he made an incredible difference. And I'm here to tell you this evening, or this morning, God has an incredible future for you. Address the mess. Become the person God wants you to be. And as you become the person God wants you to be, you can begin to realize the amazing destiny that you have. Would you say it with me? I have an amazing destiny, and it's worth addressing the mess so I can become the person I'm meant to be. Lift your hands to the Lord right now. Let the grace of God flow on you this morning. Let the grace of God flow on you for 2018. This is a great year for you. This is a great year for you. Deal with the mess. Take responsibility. Become the person God wants you to be. Lord, we thank you for your love. We thank you that your mercies are new every morning. We thank you for the incredible power of your Holy Spirit that's at work in us. And I thank you that the things that have been hanging over the heads of all these folks, that you're going to break those things this year, that the mental bondage, the emotional bondage, the emotional weights they've been carrying around. We thank you that this year they're going to, those things that have been tethered to them are going to be cut and they're going to become free. So we thank you for your amazing love. And let's say this together. Lord God, I receive you as my Lord. I thank you, Lord, for this year and all you have for me. Give me courage. Give me boldness to address the messes in my life. In Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you love the Lord, say a big amen. And give the Lord a praise offering right now. Thank the Lord for His goodness.